Real talk, real issues, real life. I got a new sheriff in town. We now return to The Rock Newman Show. Welcome back to The Rock Newman Show. Today, March the 23rd, on this beautiful, beautiful, sunshiny day in the Washington, D.C., District of Columbia. <laughs> Spectacular day. Uh, give us a call. We are at 202-889-9797. Uh, Feel free to uh, call in. We have the mayor of the District of Columbia joining us this hour. Mr. Mayor, welcome to the Rock Newman Show. Thank you, Rock. It's a real uh, delight to be here. I had hoped to be here in the uh, launching uh, of the show, and I was away and uh, got a chance to call in briefly. But uh, I wanted to get here as quickly as I could, uh, and I want to congratulate you on launching this show. It's great to have you back uh, here, and it's great to have you back connected to the people of the city. Well, thank you very much, and it is, it, it, you know, it's not just a cliche in this particular case. Mm -hmm. It's always good to be home, so thank you very mm -hmm. much. Uh, Vince, if I, can, if I can call you Vince. Absolutely. That's uh, where we, we've always been at. That's where we <laughs> roll, right? <laughs> okay. All right. You know, let's, let's, let's try to put things in perspective. Um, I had a Facebook, uh, I, I made a Facebook post yesterday, and... Um, some people love Vince Gray, and some people claim that they don't love Vince Gray so much. Mm. Um, I think there was somebody named Jesus that they uh, felt the same way about. Some, <laughs> <laughs> some people love him, and some, some didn't love him so much. But let's do this. Let's do a quick history on Vince Gray. Vin, let's, I mean, Vince Gray was born where? And went to elementary school and high school and college. Let's do it all. I'm a native Washingtonian and uh, proud to be. Uh, I grew up uh, at 6th and L Streets, uh, Northeast, which uh, I suppose we could uh, easily describe as the hood. Uh, and what a great uh, you know, experience it was growing up, getting to know so many people, some of whom uh, are still uh, good friends of mine. I uh, went to Logan Elementary School. In fact, I'm a DC Public School product. Uh, I went to Logan Elementary School uh, Langley Junior High School uh, thereafter, and then went on to Dunbar uh, High School. And uh, then stayed home thereafter too, Rock. I went to uh, George Washington University, uh, undergraduate and graduate school, and have worked my entire life uh, here in the city. So I'm probably as much of a homie as one can possibly be. I, I, I was going to say, that's, that's sure enough dyed in the wool home, it is. homegrown <laughs> <laughs> Washington, D.C. Um, Okay, there's so much for us to talk about in this hour. We'll try to get a few calls in. Um, when on the inaugural show, the fo each of the four ma mayors that um, that uh, that that I had involved, they all had their own version about home rule, why we didn't have it, why Washington D.C. didn't have it, and the prospects of getting it. Talk to us about home rule. Well, first of all, people describe it as limited home rule, which is an odd term. To me, you either have home rule or you don't. Uh, and we certainly don't have the capacity to be able to, uh, the authority to be able to make all this, the decisions that uh, people who live in a democracy uh, should be able to make. It really is, I, I call it the hypocrisy of democracy. And that is, here we are in the nation's capital, uh, in the nation that uh, you know is noted for protecting democracy. We go to Iraq, we go to Afghanistan, we go all over the world trying to protect the freedoms of other people. Yet we really haven't uh, worked to be able to make sure the people of this city uh, are free. Uh, when you look at it, uh, we got for the first time the ability to elect a mayor uh, in 1975. We elected a council uh, then prior to that. We had an appointed mayor, uh, we had an appointed council. But the reality is, even with what uh, you know, authority we've been accorded at this stage now since 1975, there's still fundamental things that we can't do. Uh, we, we can't uh, approve, you know, we don't have final approval of our budget. Our budget has to be sent to the uh, council, uh, the Congress, excuse me, after the council approves it and I sign it. It goes to the, uh, the Congress. There is no city or state in America uh, that has to do that. 
we can't approve our uh, laws. Uh, our laws have to go to the to Capitol Hill to be approved. And what's interesting, Rock, is that it adds an amazing amount of process uh, to our ability to govern here. We have thousands of hours of work that has to be done in order to accommodate that. And let me just give you an example of how ridiculous it can be. Uh, when I was on the council, uh, we, we wanted to do something which I, I didn't think was very controversial, and that is change the term handicapped to disabled. Now, I can't imagine anybody would debate that. Well, because our laws have to go to the Congress to be finally approved, it took us nine more months in order to be able to accomplish that, which is, to me is absolutely ridiculous. You know, you point out that. And if we just hold that up, changing handicap from, from the term handicap to disable, and it take nine months as a result of really not having self-determination, it's an absolute tragedy and absurdity. It is. It is a total travesty for us to be put in a situation like that. Um, and you look at our performance at this stage, um, what, what is it that people would criticize about our performance in the District of Columbia? Uh, we are a well-managed city. Uh, you know, as we were talking earlier, we just got something that I don't think any other jurisdiction in America uh, has achieved, and that is uh, because of our financial performance, especially over the last two years, um, Standard & Poor's, which is one of the rating agencies for the District of Columbia in terms of our bonds, a very important thing, just upgraded our bonds. In a climate with sequestration, where there's so much uncertainty at the federal level, uh, we have a rating agency that says, we think you guys have done a good enough job uh, to be able to be uh, upgraded. So I don't hear any rational arguments uh, about why it is that we have to continue to be subjected uh, to this. You know, and you add to the, the budget issue, you add to the, the issue with our laws, we have an outstanding congresswoman who represents the District of Columbia who doesn't even have a vote. She can't even vote on the issues that affect uh, her city, uh, despite the fact that she's now in her 12th term, uh, overwhelmingly elected uh, by the people of the District of Columbia. And of course, you know, we have aspired to, and we will continue to aspire to, uh, to, to be a state, because there's so many arguments as to why we should uh, be a state. And we are treated like a state in so many instances when you look at federal programs. The federal programs that are uh, grants that come to the city, for example, they come to us in the same way they would come to 50 other states. Has the, you just mentioned something um, the, about the upgrade, the Standard & Poor's upgrade. Mm -hmm. Has that hit the news yet? Yeah, it was in the uh, Washington Post yesterday, uh, and it was, a, it was a brief article in the Post. We're continuing to talk about it, of course, uh, but we were in New York just about three or four weeks ago to make presentations, and we were able to lay out everything that the city has done uh, over the last couple of years, and especially over the last year. And really, the only issues that were raised with us by the three rating agencies, Moody's, Fitch, and, and Standard & Poor's, was the federal climate that we're operating in. Well, we don't have any control over that. Uh, there was nothing that was said untoward about where we are uh, financially at this stage. You know, I, one of the things that I had intended to do, and I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I had intended to introduce you by saying that many people in this city, um, and I would say some that I'm surprised because they weren't necessarily, they weren't necessarily fans of Vince Gray when you came into office. Mm -hmm. And sort of the, 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 the firestorm of criticism that uh, followed your election uh, you went through some tough times. However, there, there's a body of people who know this city and know this city well, who have said that your performance while in office right now deserves another four years. Now, we can get to whether or not you're planning on seeking that four <laughs> years, <laughs> whether or not you're planning on seeking that four mm -hmm. years in a, in, in a minute. But I, I can tell you from where I sit here at 1918 Martin Luther King Avenue that um, as I have observed what has happened in this city, and, you know, be, in part because we were having this interview this morning, I drove around the city yesterday. 
I drove around and around and around. I was up at 24th and M Street. I was up by Neiman Marcus up on Western Avenue. I was over here in Southeast Washington. I was at the um, at Horace and Dickey's Fish in, <laughs> in, in Northeast. I was all over the city. And I see building. I see cranes. I see trucks. I see holes in the ground. There is a building boom that is going on here that is absolutely unprecedented. It is. And we're really, really proud of it. You know, Rock, not to make this, for me anyway, simpler than what it is, but uh, there were certain things we said we were going to do when we came into office, and we worked very hard to be able to fulfill those things. And putting people back to work and doing economic development happened to be two of the most important of those things. Uh, you know, we, we, we actually count the cranes uh, in the city. We have our mayor for, deputy mayor for economic development who does that. We have 56 cranes that are actively working in the city at this stage. And not just in the downtown area. As you indicated, they're all over the city. One of the things that I said I was going to do was, frankly, work hard to bring prosperity and economic development to the east end uh, of the city. Uh, because it just hasn't happened to that, ex that, that extent uh, in the past. And we are doing that. Uh, you look at the schools that are being built. Just, just a couple of days ago, we had a groundbreaking for a brand new recreation center at Barry Farm. Uh, we're going to rebuild Barry Farm. And we made a promise, which will be kept, that the people who live in Barry Farm who want to come back uh, after the building is done, they will have the right. When you say you're going to gonna rebuild Barry Farm, what are you going to... What are you going to tear down? What are you going to put up? Well, we're probably going to tear down over time most of the housing, and we're going to put up mixed income uh, housing uh, so that uh, it will be, it's, it's called an, the uh, New Communities uh, Project, and it will be uh, mixed income housing. There will be enough housing there for people who are of relatively low income, uh, those who have middle income, and those who can pay market rate uh, to be able to live in the same, uh, you know, geographic area, the same uh, blocks, if you will. One of the mistakes I think we made, you know, I don't know, 70, 80 years ago was some of the housing policies uh, in the city. We, and not only here, but across the nation. You know, we basically pushed a lot of people who were economically challenged uh, into the same areas, and it created problems. And so uh, some of our children have been doomed by their geography, not, not by their ability. And those are the things that we want to resolve. We want to keep people in the city. Uh, we are growing rapidly. We now have 632,000 people uh, here in the city. We have a population that is larger than Vermont, population larger than uh, Wyoming. And we want people to be able to stay here. There is a term that everybody uses now that, you know, is, is, has gen engendered fear in a lot of folks, and that is gentrification. You know what? That was, next, that was next on my list. As you mm -hmm. talk about wanting to keep people here mm -hmm. and all the good that is going on, next on my list to discuss was gentrification. And it, it is a huge concern of people, and that is people don't want to be closed out. One of the things that will, my budget will be transmitted to the council uh, on next Thursday, on the 28th of March. And one of the headlines, the headline, will be, because of our prosperity in the city, I want to invest in affordable housing $100 million uh, in order to be able to build, between now and 2020, 10,000 units of affordable housing. And for people who really are economically challenged, you know, those who are between, whose household income is between zero uh, and 30 percent of the uh, area uh, median income, uh, working to say that you may not have means, but this will continue to be a city uh, where you can remain if you choose to. The other side of the equation, too, Rock, is not just saying that we're going to make sure we have in, uh, housing that is affordable to people, but we're also working on the employment side, and that is getting people to a point where they actually can earn uh, more money. I don't know a person who doesn't want to earn something, you know, who doesn't want to be able to feel like they are, um, you know, making their own way. And that is exactly what we're trying to do, to get people back to work uh, through our One City, One Hire program uh, since September of 2011. We've gotten 5,600 people jobs in the District of Columbia from all over the city. And, and interestingly enough, the, the overwhelming majority of those who we've gotten back to work live in wards 5, 7, and 8. 
where we had some of the highest unemployment levels uh, imaginable. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. I understand we have a caller on the line. There's one line left open. The telephone number to reach us to talk to Mayor Vince Gray is 202-889-9797. We have Simi on the line from uh, Columbia Heights. Simi, welcome to America. Thank you. Good to be on. <laughs> I saw that name and I said S I M I and I could not resist that. <laughs> Welcome to America. Uh, thank, thank you, you for you. calling. That was the Eddie Murphy movie. That's right. <laughs> Come, coming, coming to, to America. America. <laughs> uh, Mayor Gray, I wanted to talk to you because I recently had the chance to talk with Tommy Wells from Ward 6. And with his upcoming campaign, he is focusing on making DC a more walkable city. What are your plans to do the same? Well, I, I wish you had been following this because we have re we released just a few weeks ago um, our Sustainability DC, Sustainable DC plan. Have you not seen that? I haven't. Well, I want to make sure you get a copy. If you give us the information, we'll see that you get it. Okay. But the Sustainable DC plan actually started with a vision statement that we released in April of 2011, uh, 2012, excuse me. Uh, it focuses uh, on a number of areas, uh, initially on seven to nine areas, including things like jobs in the economy, uh, health and wellness, uh, the climate and the environment, uh, water, transportation, uh, just a host of things. And we now have a document that's put, been put together that has 143 uh, initiatives in it. And it is a, a long-term plan. It is a 20-year plan that we already have started working on. Uh, for example, uh, one of the goals is to be able to make the Anacostia River fishable and swimmable uh, for everybody, which uh, would be a, a, an enormous accomplishment to, uh, you know, to begin to uh, diversify our transportation options uh, here in the District of Columbia. Um, we, you may know that we're bringing streetcars back to the District of Columbia. It's an is initiative we're working on. Uh, the first line will be back. Uh, by the uh, by, the end of 2013, we're working on what's where, called. Where, where will that first line be? It'll be on H Street and Out Benning Road. Uh, it'll be be right around where Union Station is uh, on H Street, and it will go out to right around Spingarn High School. This is an exciting, exciting time for it Washington. Really, it, it really is. It absolutely is, Rock. You know. Well, thank you. I hope to take a look at your plan. And thanks again. Thanks, well, Simi. Well, let's we can talk about that for another hour, can't yeah. we? <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you, Rock. Thank you so much. Um, let, you know, to piggyback off of her question, I thought she was going to steal it from me. Um, I saw a uh, I saw an article uh, that or a comment that you made that you want Washington D.C. to be the the most the, the greenest city in the country. That's right. Talk about that. The greenest, healthiest, uh, most livable uh, city uh, in the nation, and that is exactly what our plan uh, attempts to do. We actually have now, I mean, it's, it's amazing how starting to be routinely people are thinking about green roofs. Uh, and that is, uh, it, it is a great way of retaining uh, storm water uh, rather than having it run off. And what a lot of people don't realize is when the storm water runs off of a roof, runs into the street, it winds up into our, you know, catch basins, our sewers, and uh, ultimately winds up in our river. It's one of the reasons why the Anacostia River is constantly polluted. Yeah. So with the green roofs, we're going to be able to retain storm water. It will be good for vegetation, but it also will be great for uh, the environment. We, we actually have um, the, largest number, the square, largest number of square feet of green roofs. Uh, in the uh, nation. You know, you mentioned, you mentioned just a moment ago uh, about making the Anacostia River fishable and, uh, and, and swimmable. That would be, that would just be an absolute dr dream come true. And what I'm going to do here, folks, on the Rock Newman Show is we're going to go to break. Vince Gray is staying with us the entire hour. Again, you can reach us at 202 889-9797. We've got a lot more to cover with the mayor after these uh, commercial messages. And I want to welcome you back to the Rock Newman Show. Today, March 23rd, we have Washington, D.C. Uh, Mayor Vince Gray in studio. Um, before we go back to uh, his honor, um, we also have as an our advertiser, one of our advertisers, uh, the MGM Grand National Harbor. And I want you folks to be aware 
of this development that is coming in. Um, it is an incredible project on the shores of the Potomac River uh, over in Oxon Hill, Maryland. It will be something that will service the entire metropolitan area. Um, I was uh, with some of the folks from the MGM yesterday, and I saw some of the preliminary drawings, and they are nothing short of spectacular. It is going to be a project that is going to be approach a billion dollars to throw off just thousands, thousands of jobs, and the kind of uh, economic, it will be an economic engine uh, for this region, uh, unlike much of what we've seen, and it will you will have uh, your you will be able to enjoy your gaming, your entertainment, just untold food ops, foods and dining and culinary options. So as you see this coming down the pike, I just strongly urge you to uh, look upon it, to be aware of the kind of jobs if you're looking for a job in the, in the future, and to support this uh, incredible effort by the MGM Grand National Harbor. In the meantime, if you want to go get your gaming on, you can go to Detroit or any of their other great, great facilities. Certainly, uh, they're the largest gaming uh, um, um, corporate entity in the world and have everything to you know, satisfy all of your pleasurable needs in Las Vegas if you want to go that way. But back here at home, Mayor Gray, um, there has been some talk about the term Washington, D.C. versus District of Columbia. Can you tell me what's behind uh, sort of the move? It, we're, we're looking to get away from Washington, D.C. and call D.C. the District of Columbia. Is that the official that, way to do it? Yeah, I that mean, is our official name. Uh -huh. And frankly, until we become the state of New Columbia, which I think will happen at some point, um, I want us to be able to have our own distinct identity. Uh, I've heard people say, you know, we're the Washington on the East Coast and there's the other one on the West Coast, uh, the state of Washington. So, again, it, it's about instilling pride uh, in our city, making sure we have our own unique uh, and distinct uh, identity. And if you think about it, there's so many people over the years who've said, I'm from D.C., I'm from D.C., which, of course, is the District of Columbia. That is our official and formal name. That's, the, that's what we're going to have on our tags rather than Washington, D.C. We're already, uh, you know, working to, uh, working to change that. I, um, as I told you, I drove around the city yesterday. And, you know, yesterday was, let's see, in the evening when I was going around, I was, it, was, it was in the afternoon, more like 2, 3 o'clock or so. Um, I saw some homeless people. Now, actually, as I was doing the drive, given some of the reports that I've seen, I would have anticipated that I was going to see more people on the street than I actually saw. Recently, there were a couple of long articles in the Washington Post talking about the despair of the homeless. Can you t tell us what's going on? Well, I think when you look at homelessness, you've got to recognize, uh, Rock, which I know you do, um, that we really have what I would say are three groups of people. We have, uh, you know, singles who, um, you know, you see on the streets, uh, individuals. Then we have homeless families, and they characteristically are uh, young moms with maybe one, two, in some instances, more children. And then we've seen an increasing problem with uh, youth uh, who are homeless. In fact, that's the group I used to work with before I became a member of the Council of the District of Columbia. I, uh, I was the executive director of Covenant House, uh, which is an organization that serves uh, homeless youth. In fact, Covenant House used to have an outreach center right in this block. Uh, and now, of course, still has a very strong presence uh, here in Ward 8. Uh, the people that you see on the streets, uh, and there are, there are places for people to go. There are people who refuse to go into our shelters. And they oftentimes are people who have mental health problems, uh, people who have substance abuse problems, or people who have both. Uh, but there's a lot of outreach effort on the streets to try to get people to come into the, um, you know, to come into the uh, shelters for uh, singles. 
Some of them have, you know, mental health problems of a very severe nature that they deal with uh, every day, and they have a lot of suspicions and fears about going into uh, shelters. Uh, and those are the folks that we try to work with as much as we can uh, on the streets. But, you know, again, by comparison to, say, 20, 25 years ago, we don't have nearly the number of people on the streets. Uh, you know, one of the things, w one of those articles, it seemed to particularly uh, be harsh about your facility, your homeless shelter at D.C. General Hospital. And I actually had the occasion to go over there, a dear friend of mine, and I'm yours also, uh, Dick Gregory mm -hmm. was uh, doing a presentation over there. The mm -hmm. uh, the uh, one, one of the groups that's working with them, I think, feeding the families there, mm -hmm. arranged uh, for Dick Gregory to go in and do a presentation. And man, he had a very, it was very very well attended. Um, and I thought the irony was that they one of the things they attempted to focus on was lack of nutrition or food or whatever. And I had gone there. It was an evening event. And I had been ripping and running all day, had very little to eat since early that morning. And I actually got one of their trays. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you something. It was some. I didn't. Well, let me tell the truth. I got one tray. Mm -hmm. I ate it. <laughs> and you got another and then I got another <laughs> <laughs> so, speaking, speaking of my observation of the food there um, but what I did see was uh, how that center is actually housing families mm -hmm. it is and of course it is you know it, it, these these situations are portrayed sometimes in the most dramatic ways because that's the way journalism works as we all know uh, but you know, it, the conditions there are are characteristically better than what they are portrayed as, but I would never ever say that that's a place where we want you know people to be, sure, we want families to be. Sure, we've got young children there, and we're working to. The first thing we do, frankly, Rock, is to try to divert them from having to go there in the first place. Sure. And what a lot of people don't realize is that of every ten families that we work with, nine of them never wind up in the shelter. We we're, we're able to divert them in other ways with family. Uh, get them into a housing situation. There are any number of options that we exercise. And then of the 1 in 10 that come there, and the numbers really have increased in the last, uh, I would say, last 18 months, we work to try to get them out of there as quickly as we possibly can because there's nothing more destabilizing than not having a place that you can call uh, home. It's one of the reasons why, you know, as I indicated earlier, we're going to put $100 million uh, into affordable housing to try to get these families into, uh, into permanent places. It also is a product of, you know, as we recognize, you know, a, uh, you know, a uh, place that was affordable today that may not be affordable uh, tomorrow. I had an interesting experience recently, you know, having grown up at, on 6th Street, Northeast 6 and L, we grew up in an apartment that um, actually had been in my family, uh, you know, for years and years and years. My, my parents, uh, you know, when they got, first got married, moved in there. My brother and I grew up in that apartment. My brother, until he became very ill, he's so ill now he can't go back uh, yeah. there. So we gave up the apartment about eight, nine months ago. Rock, I went past there the other day, and it's being renovated. It was sold. The building had six units, and it was sold for almost $900,000, which is beyond belief to me. Yeah. And they're now putting a lot of money into renovating it. And I say that simply to say that uh, given where my family was and what we could afford, I know we wouldn't be able to go back there. And there's yeah. so many situations like that in the city. And that's a part of what we're seeing with our homeless families, that there's a shrinking pool of housing that they can afford. And uh, what we're trying to do is to, is to be able to preserve as much housing as we can so that we can continue to be uh, a diverse city. We can continue to be a city where people can stay who want to be here. Okay, again, there's so much to cover. Let's, uh, let, let's, let's make a pretty big switch here. Um, you came out, um, as far as I can remember, <clears throat> more vocally and, and, and more strongly than any of uh, the local politicians that, in, in my memory, in talking about what has become a lightning rod issue. The 
the the the the, the Washington professional football team uh, has a has a racist nickname, and you seem to call a spade a spade. Um, I want to ask you two questions. If you can elaborate on your feelings about the name, and I know probably yourself like me, I have, I've been a lifelong fan. Absolutely. Um, so if you can talk, one, about the name, and then two, or have there been any serious discussions about the possibility of the team coming back into the District of Columbia? Well, it's a great question. Uh, like you, I absolutely love our football team. Um, you know, I, I followed the team. I was so excited. I was hoping that they would draft uh, RG3. Uh, they did. And, uh, you know, in his very first year, he really ignited, reignited interest in this team. Electrif he, he electrified this, this, this region. Yeah. And it's absolutely a shame that he got hurt because who knows how far they would have gone into the playoffs. Think about it. They were up 14 nothing on Seattle when he got hurt. And then, of course, they lost the game uh, after that. So, I say that simply to say that I am as big a lover of the team as anybody. Um, what happened was, how this got started in the most recent uh, situation was, I was at one of my press briefings, and somebody asked me the same question about the team coming back to the city. And what did I think about that? I said, well, I want the team back in the city. You know, I'll work as hard as I possibly can to make that happen. And they said, well, where do you think they might go? I said, well, the most logical place is if you uh, tear down RFK Stadium and build another stadium uh, there. And the question was, do you think there'll be any uh, issues associated with that? I said, well, I'm absolutely sure there will be some issues because that's federal property. The team's name uh, is inflammatory uh, to a lot of people. You know, the Redskins is considered to be a racist term by, by many. And I think there will be issues associated with it. And that kicked off this entire discussion. And uh, Rock is pretty amazing to me, uh, the number of people who have come up to me and said, we appreciate the fact that you put that issue uh, on the table. Um, it, I mean, when you step back and think about it, it is just incredible. Can you imagine, you know, putting that in the context of some other uh, racial and ethnic group uh, in this nation? And maybe, maybe it hasn't become more of an issue to the people who are directly affected because we have so a few Native Americans yeah. remaining. Well, you know, I, I, in, in I this, had in, in studio last week at this very same hour, uh, Dr. S Susan Harjo, who was the lead plaintiff against the uh, against the team against the uh, against the NFL, and we went into great depth on this particular subject. Mm -hmm. And I was, uh, frankly speaking, uh, more <laughs> more passionate than I had anticipated being. And I talked about it in very very raw terms, mm -hmm. in terms of it being a slur. And if you know if it was called, and I you know I just I I didn't mince words. I said you know. If it was called the nigger skins, if it was mm -hmm. called, you know, any other, any other net, but the, 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 the redneck cracker skins, you know, I mean, I mean, <laughs> total it, outrage. because you have to, you, you know, to me, that is putting it in its proper context mm -hmm. when folks say, well, I don't find that offensive. Well, internalize it and personalize it. And perhaps you will. Absolutely. So hopefully, you know, this, this, this struggle will continue and we will get that changed. Um, as I use the word. As I use the word struggle, um, you know, I was mostly out of town uh, in the Las Vegas area shortly after you uh, won your election. And man, once your um, uh, inauguration took place, there was a hailstorm of criticism. Um, um, I was wondering when I saw you up close today, if you were going to have some horns and a tail, <laughs> because that's that's how you and your campaign were being uh, made out to be. As I understand it, there is still an ongoing federal investigation. Now, one thing I was so impressed about in looking from afar is I never, Lord knows you were someone that personified, don't let them see you sweat. If I don't know if you were sweating or not, but you, if you were, you sure didn't. You sure didn't let them see you sweating. So there was an investigation that was launched. I don't think it is yet concluded from the most recent reports. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, it, it is ongoing, and uh, essentially what I've done is said, look, you know, I have a, you know an attorney who's representing me in this situation, and I came here to do a job, and that's what I intend to do, and I'm going to do that every day. 
And not only, you know, did I, quote, unquote, as you say, not let them see me sweat. I wasn't sweating. Uh, I came here for a particular reason. I, I love this city. I'm a native of this city. I knew there were certain things that uh, people deserved in this city, and I, I have focused on my job uh, from, from, from day one. And I think the accomplishments speak for themselves. You know, we talked about being able to focus on public safety. We have the lowest number of homicides in 51 years uh, last year in the District of Columbia. Um, we said we would focus on restoring fiscal stability. Uh, we now have a fund balance in the city of $1.5 billion. I don't think there's another state or city in America uh, that can, can boast that. Can you limit $20? <laughs> <laughs> uh, might be a pretty healthy uh, interest rate there, Rock. <laughs> uh, but anyway, we, we, have, we have really established fiscal stability uh, in this city. We said we were going to get people back to work again, and we've been doing that. Our, our unemployment rate, when we came in, right after we came in, was 11.2 percent. It is now 8.5 percent. It's come down almost three percentage points, despite the fact that we are in this climate of federal uh, uncertainty with sequestration. You're talking about furloughs and people are uh, losing their jobs and, and all that's associated with that at the federal level. You talked about the, uh, the building boom uh, in the city, and it is absolutely unprecedented. That, that is uh, indeed the case. We said we were going to focus on uh, sustainability. We talked about that other, you know, earlier with Simi uh, on the phone, uh, about being able to make the city the healthiest and greenest uh, in the nation. Um, we have focused on those things that we said we were going to do, and that is what has been my focus, the focus of my administration. I frankly have some of the most talented people imaginable uh, working with me, and it's great to be able to go to work with them every day, to know that they're focused on the jobs that they came to do, and to know that we're making a difference. One of the most important things we're focusing on, Rock, is education. You know, getting our, getting our kids to the point where they can graduate from high school, that they have a skill set if they choose to go to work thereafter, or they can go on to college. Now, we've got a distance to travel. But I tell you one of the things that I did, I did the legislation when I was on the council, and now we've been working heartily on it uh, since I've been mayor for, for, for the uh, last two plus years. And that is creating the most robust early childhood education program. So uh, critically um, important. Critical. Um, we are the only city in America that has universal pre-kindergarten. We have a seat for every three and four year old. I was going to say, what, yeah. what does that mean? It means universal pre-kindergarten. Yeah, it means that we have a seat for every three and four-year-old in the city whose family wants them to be in a program. And we do it in three ways. Uh, what I've tried to do and we're doing now is redefining when school starts. You know, historically people have said s children should go to school when they're age five. And I asked person after person, I said, why is that? Why do you think that was a decision that was made? And people look at you like you have three heads uh, at that point. Because I don't think they know. Right. Somebody just made that decision. And by the way, I was at a lecture recently uh, with two University of Washington researchers who made the point, which some of us have believed for some time, 92% of brain development has already occurred by the time a child is five years of age. Wow. Which means we've lost a tremendous opportunity if we wait until they're five. So we now ha are getting kids into our D.C. public schools at age three. We're getting them into our charter schools at age three and in our child care centers. I'm now moving uh, to try to get more infants and toddlers uh, into programs because especially in some of our uh, economically, uh, socially challenged areas of the city, we can help those kids by getting them in programs early. And frankly, we can help their parents too. It'll allow their parents to get out and get a job. It will allow their parents, frankly, to be able to know how to be able to be better parents as a result of that. It's one of the most important things we can do. And frankly, you connect the dots. If we get these kids going earlier, get them a better education, it's going to make the employment issue as they get older much easier to solve. Well, I just got a flash that uh, we are uh, running down on time, but I really want to get in a few subjects, uh, get, your, uh, get your quick comments on. Um, is Obama a friend of Washington, D.C., or the District of Columbia? I think he has been. Um, you know, there are people who think he should have done more. Uh, I wish he had uh, been very much more vocal on the issue of budget autonomy. Yes. Uh, but he has put it in his budget last year. We, we wanted him to talk about it in the State of the Union uh, speech 
they had other things that they wanted to talk about, but he he has had it in his budget, and I think it will be in his uh, you know fiscal year 14 budget again. He put the tags on to say taxation yeah. without representation, right. uh, which is, is symbolic, but at least it is a step in the right direction. And one of the things that he did with me in the very early going, because I met with him in the early going, was um, his his agencies, you know, like Health and Human Services and the Department of uh, the Interior, uh, the Department of Education. They worked very closely with us in the city. We have very close relationships with those secretaries, and they've done a number of things for the city. So I would say, yeah, I wish there was more that was done, but I think he's done a lot for the city. Yeah. Um, Vince Gray's biggest disappointment as mayor. Well, you know, I, thought, I, I think about this a lot, and I tell you, it, it was difficult to come up with an answer because <laughs> we've had so many successes as mayor. I had one recently um, where, uh, you know, we've wanted to do more for small business. Uh, our uh, certified business enterprises in the District of Columbia, our CBE program. We had a piece of legislation we advanced that we felt would, uh, you know, open more doors to our small businesses. And by the way, Rock, more than 75% of our businesses in the city are small businesses. Cl classified as small businesses. That's right. Mm -hmm. So the legislation got changed when it got into the council. and. Ultimately, it really created some issues for us. Um, I won't go into all of what they are because it would take more time than we have. And I ultimately vetoed uh, the legislation, uh, not because I really wanted to. I wanted to move this forward. But I knew that we would have more problems than we had solved as a result of this legislation. So we actually are starting all over again. Uh, I just appointed a task force to work with us. In 60 days or less than 60 days, we'll have a new piece of legislation We'll move it forward into the council, and hopefully they will move uh, quickly on it to help solve some of the problems that were created by the previous uh, legislation. But I really wanted to be able to be, you know, wherever I was on this day. Uh, I happen to be here, of course. Yeah, thank you very uh, much. <laughs> <laughs> wherever I was, I wanted to be able to stand up and say, we really have moved the ball down the field for our small businesses, and we have not gotten there yet. Um, I'm going to keep it to three, if you can. Um, your top uh, Vince Grace successes as mayor. Well, some of those I've talked about. Yeah. Uh, first of all, and that is bringing back fiscal stability. A right. billion and a half dollars in the bank. Um, uh, we still got a lot of challenges ahead to be able to meet those, but uh, the, uh, the fiscal stability that we have restored, uh, getting people back to work, bringing down that unemployment rate uh, mm -hmm. the way that we have, and um, my early childhood education programs. Uh, those, there, there are many more I could cite. In fact, we've got a book that I'm going to leave with you that is about 20 uh, plus pages that talks about uh, our accomplishments. But those are the top three among many that I could cite, Rob. You know, it's a, it, and it says, and I'll hold it up for those that are viewing uh, locally and around the world at uh, www.rocknewmanshow.com. It says, Gray Administration Year 2 Report. There are some, it's really impressive. And frankly speaking, you know, a lot of folks put stuff out and, you know, don't necessarily, you can't necessarily verify it. But this mm -hmm. is uh, something, folks, that is verifiable. Um, you care to make any breaking news here uh, on the Rock <laughs> Newman Show on March the 23rd? Uh, let's see. My note says, Vince Gray's future intention. <laughs> <laughs> well, my Just immediate Between me and you. <laughs> okay, right, right. And, and limited to your... Closest 10,000 friends, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, my, my immediate intentions are to continue to, to, do our, uh, to do our job, to do the job that we set out to. You know, somebody has said to me once, and I think it's true, that good service is good politics. <clears throat> and uh, I have believed right from the very start of my, you know, career as a, as a council member and on through being the mayor that serving the people the way we promised and try to meet those needs as best we can is a great way of, of, of letting people know uh, that you've done the job and will continue to do the job. So that's what I'm focused on right now, and that is getting the job done. We will continue to do that, and, you know, when other decisions are ready to be made, we'll make them. Fantastic. I really, really want to thank you and your staff for uh, being able to put your schedule together in a way that you were able to join us for an hour today. I certainly would like to have you back on a on a recurring basis, as, I'd like to do a, that. as a matter of fact, as we uh, you know speak to the speak to the people in Washington D.C. and the metropolitan area, folks, I want to let you know that we've got one more hour of the Rock Newman Show. 
uh, coming up is going to be Jimmy Lee Solomon, uh, formerly of Major League Baseball, and Kerry Davis, uh, Vice President of Sports Acquisition and Programming at HBO. Mayor Gray, again, thank you so very much for joining us here, you, 1480 Mark. and The Rock Newman Show. Folks, we'll be back momentarily. Don't touch that dial and stay plugged in around the world at www.rocknewmanshow.show.